you guys so much to everyone who is joining us uh, for another amazing webinar. Um, we're really excited to have uh, Dr. Dr. Jody Rumer with us today. Um, just a reminder, please, everyone, type your Q&As, uh, your questions in the Q&A. We have disabled the chat. So, um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us and, and thank you, uh, Dr. Rumer, for your time and, and sharing this with us. So, um, Dr. Rumer's background is marine biology and actually comparative physiology, and she's currently an associate professor at the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies at James Cook University. But she'll talk a little today about uh, where her research actually takes her, because it's some pretty incredible places. And uh, she's going to talk about a tale of two sharks, so two of the species she's actually working with, which I'm really excited about because they're maybe lesser known, they're a little bit smaller, uh, so don't get as much attention, but are absolutely incredible. So thank you again to everyone joining us, and I'm going to let uh, Dr. Rumer take over. Okay, thanks, Jillian. So um, as Jillian mentioned, I'm going to tell a tale of two sharks. Um, see what I did there. So here's um, a bit of a sneak peek as to the two sharks that I'll be talking about. Um, but before I get started, uh, as Jillian mentioned, my name is Jody Rummer. Um, I'm really thrilled and I'm super honored to be doing this presentation for Sharks for Kids. Um, for the past eight and a half years or so, I've been based at James Cook University in Australia at the Center of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies. And there we have a whole center that's devoted to studying coral reefs uh, which is pretty appropriate given that we're situated right in the middle of the Great Barrier Reef. I don't work on corals directly, though, as you may have guessed, I do work on a group of animals that are absolutely critical to the health of coral reefs and marine ecosystems worldwide, the sharks. And I lead a research program and team called PhysioShark, which I'll talk more about today. And that's the logo that's in the center, um, top center of the screen there. But I haven't always been in Australia, as you can maybe tell from my accent. Um, in fact, this is where I grew up, surrounded by cornfields in the middle of the United States, Illinois to be exact, and very far from sharks, very far from the oceans, and this is literally my parents' backyard. Um, did I always want to be a marine biologist or more specifically to research sharks? In hindsight, I, I think I really did. Uh, this is me, maybe when I was a bit closer to the age of some of the kids that are watching and listening today. Um, now I'll give you another clue. I study stress in fish, including sharks. And looking back at this photo now, all I can think about is how that fish was probably a bit too small for me to be catching it. And I was probably holding it out of the water way too long, making it quite stressed while my dad was taking the photo. So that may have been the very beginning of my career, going fishing with my dad, and of course watching beautiful documentaries on TV about the ocean and fish and sharks and coral reefs and marine biologists. And that's really what inspired me while I grew up surrounded by cornfields. Fast forward, and these days I'm often asked, what are my favorite species of sharks? Which is why I now tell a tale of two sharks. So PhysioShark is the name of the research program that encompasses all of the shark research that me and my team do, and where are all of the cool shark stories that I get to tell where they all come from. And the name comes from two words. The second, of course, you know, shark, but the first comes from physio. Now, many of you think, uh, might think of physio as in physiotherapy. Um, as humans, we might go to a physio to get pain or injury or disease treated through exercise and movement, massage, um, sometimes manipulation. And though I've had to maneuver and manipulate myself around sharks a fair few times, the physio in the word physio shark actually stands for physiology. So I'm a physiologist by training. As Jillian mentioned, I'm a comparative physiologist. And in the most generic sense, physiology is the branch of biology that deals with the normal functions of living organisms and their parts. 
This can include tendons and ligaments and muscles, heart function, um, digestion, kidneys, bones, reproduction, blood flow and oxygen transport, and even brain function. And that's a lot. So physiology is a really big field of study. I focus my research on only a couple of these areas, mainly those that are associated with movement, breathing, and blood flow, and how the heart functions. So athletic performance, so to speak. But of course, my athletes are sharks. So why would I study athletic performance in sharks? That's a really good question. We can think of how efficient sharks are at breathing and getting oxygen into their body, to their muscles that power swimming so that they can capture prey and evade a predator, how their muscles work, how their heart pumps blood around their body. Um, when that blood pumps around the body, that's transporting oxygen to those muscles that fuel the swimming that sharks do. And I've been doing this for my whole career, actually, and not just in sharks, but in sort of regular fish as well. And it turns out that fish are far better at transporting oxygen around their body than we humans are. In fact, sharks, well, fish in general, are better than even our best human athletes. But of course, fish and these sharks for example, aren't in it for gold medals or um, activity goals on their Apple Watch or for improving their good looks, which is why a lot of people might exercise. Sharks have to be good athletes. They have to be the best athletes, in fact, to basically eat and not get eaten. And for some, this is more of a challenge than others. They have to breathe oxygen to swim and move and to digest their food and also to find a suitable mate so they can reproduce and ensure that a next generation of sharks will survive. And that ensures that species and populations persist and that also ensures that ecosystems stay healthy. So they have to be fantastic athletes for a lot bigger reasons than we do. However, stress can really impact sharks' performance. And that's been the focus of my research, especially in the face of climate change. Today, we're changing our oceans at a rate faster than has ever been documented in human history. And these are the issues that my team and I have been addressing in our research on sharks and other fishes. And especially in the tropics, where we think some of these ecosystems will be heavily affected. As you might know, here where I'm based on the Great Barrier Reef, we've had really warm temperatures over the past several years due to global warming, and that's caused the Great Barrier Reef to bleach three times in the past five years. And so this is a big stressor that we're really worried about, not just here on the Great Barrier Reef, but worldwide. How will climate change affect our ocean ecosystems and the organisms that those ecosystems support? So let me tell you a bit more about the physio-shark research by using my two favorite species of sharks. So this here is the black tip reef shark. And this is the epaulette shark. These are two very different species of sharks for lots of different reasons, but I study them for very similar reasons, which I'll share with you today. So starting with the epaulette shark, I want to take you here to where I live in Australia and specifically the Great Barrier Reef, which you can see from space. It spans 2300 kilometers or about 1500 miles along the east coast of Australia. Um, it's about the size of Germany in total. It's the largest continuous reef on the planet and home to about 150 species of sharks and rays. Most of our field work on the epaulette shark species takes place in the southern part of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, that's Heron Island. And a lot of our lab work um, occurs here in my laboratory at James Cook University, which is where the yellow star is there. So you can see that, that my lab is situated sort of right in the middle of the Great Barrier Reef, but we have a lot of opportunities to work at field stations along the entire span of the Great Barrier Reef. So probably the best place to see epaulette sharks 
is off of Heron Island in the Southern Great Barrier Reef. And I wanna take you there. So this is some of the very first parts of physio shark research that we've done with my team. And as you can see here, these are really shallow reef flats off of Heron Island. Um, this is the perfect habitat for epaulette sharks. Um, their best quality is their ability to hide. Um, they belong to a group called the carpet sharks, and I like to think of them as sort of crawling along the carpet, um, which is kind of what they do. They're even called walking sharks because they can use their fins modified to sort of walk along the sand or the reef flat. You can see that they can also hide pretty well. Um, what makes us really want to study them is that they develop in eggs that are fertilized internally, and then the mother deposits them on the reef flats where they develop for about three to five months. Now during this time, as you can see here in this video, the embryo has to tolerate whatever conditions are happening around it. The embryo cannot swim away, so we, have to, we are able to raise these eggs in the laboratory under different climate change conditions, and we can monitor the health and the growth and the development and even the tail movements um, of these developing embryos, how much oxygen they're using, how much they're breathing, how fast the embryo is consuming the yolk, which is that round circle inside the egg there, that's their food while they're living there. So these are some of the reasons that make us really want to study them. Um, they, when they hatch, we can monitor lots of these characteristics as little hatchlings as well. We can monitor their activity levels. We can monitor how much oxygen they're consuming under all of these different climate change scenarios. What we already know is that no matter if the eggs are raised under current day conditions or carbon dioxide levels or ocean acidification levels that are coming with climate change, this does not affect the embryos in any of these traits that we measure, which is really interesting. They can tolerate these challenging conditions from very early on in their life. But we don't know yet all of the different ways in which temperature affects their development while they're in the egg. And we think that, that may be one of their biggest challenges now and into the future with ocean warming. In fact, we're doing a lot of work with temperature now, not only with the eggs, but also with the hatchlings, which you're seeing here. Um, monitoring how much food they're eating, how much they're growing, if they hatch in uh, normal temperatures or temperatures that are predicted for the middle of this century or the end of the century with global warming. We're even using ultrasound on pregnant females, pregnant mothers, very similar to what might be used on a human female in the hospital when she's having a baby. So one of the reasons that we really like to study um, these sharks is because they're small enough to be able to work with in the laboratory. We can do lots of these types of experiments, um, uh, look at their temperature preference, look at their hiding behaviors, their feeding behaviors, how much energy they're using for a lot of these different traits, um, even monitoring how much they're breathing um, before and after exercise and just makes for a really nice experimental condition. And we think that also because of the habitats where they live, uh, these really shallow reef flats, they're hiding within the reef flats, um, that they might already be creating challenging microhabitats for themselves. So a lot of the news that came out from some of our studies suggests that these shy epaulette sharks, you know, that hide a lot, maybe they're shy, um, might thrive under climate change conditions um, because they're already used to those really challenging water quality conditions in those shallow waters where they live right now. So we did start um, this research in my laboratory investigating how these sharks would cope with ocean acidification. So that's one part of climate change that our oceans are facing. Um, and it turns out they are really tough. And we do think that in this case, they are very much a product of their environment. Um, but I think let's not be fooled into thinking that all is well for these sharks with climate change. 
And what I mentioned um, a little bit earlier when I was um, showing this video is that temperature is one of the things that we're really trying to hone in on with these epaulette sharks. Um, some of our preliminary research that we published a couple of years ago suggests that temperature is going to be an issue for these um, developing eggs and embryos and the new hatchlings. Um, one of our earlier findings was when that we maintained shark eggs at either current day temperatures or ocean warming temperatures, we noticed some really big problems in what these sharks look like when they hatched. Um, when we examined the hatchlings, the warm water hatchlings didn't have these pronounced patterns like the, the big circle epaulets on the sides of their face and the prominent bands and spots, this pattern that is so characteristic of the shark species. They didn't have that as defined as their current day condition counterparts, the sharks that we're developing at today's temperatures. Now we think that this might be a problem for these particular sharks when they hide or are trying to fool predators as these big circles on the sides of their cheeks, so to speak, they, we think that they might uh, be there to simulate either really big eyes of a bigger animal or the spiracles, the little breathing holes that are on a, a big stingray. And so if that's the case, then their top predator, which is a bird, might think that they're too big to eat. So this could be a really big problem under ocean warming conditions. Um, if their top predator no longer thinks that they're too big of a meal to eat. So we definitely need to continue our work um, with temperature with this particular species. And that's what we're doing in my lab today here at James Cook University in Australia. So for my second shark species, this is the black tip reef shark. And for this particular species, I'm going to take you to French Polynesia, um, to an island called Morea. And Morea is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And this is really where a lot of the flagship studies associated with PhysioShark really commenced. What I want to really focus on here is this map. Um, what this map shows you is French Polynesia is outlined here. Are you able to see my, um, my cursor? Uh, you move it again? Yes. Outlining? Yep, yep I can Area see Area number nine. Yes. Okay, so that's French Polynesia. French Polynesia is currently the largest shark sanctuary on the planet, which is one of the reasons why we work here. All of the sharks in these waters in French Polynesia are protected from all acts of fishing and other human-induced exploitation. So it allows us to look just at climate change for these sharks and without any of these other stressors being a part of their lives, which is a really great opportunity for us. So I'll talk more about this shark sanctuary a bit later. But meanwhile, like I mentioned, let's go to French Polynesia. So we first fly into Tahiti, and then the island of Morea is um, just about a 40 minute ferry ride right off the coast of Tahiti. And we've got about 10 to 11 potential shark nurseries around this island. So I should emphasize that we work with newborn black tip reef sharks. We started this project in 2013, and just a couple months ago, um, I just got back from my 10th trip, which is really awesome. Now we're really lucky to collaborate with a French institution uh, while we're on the, the island and that's where we base our, our team and that's where we base our research equipment and laboratory experiments. Now because these potential nurseries are so close to shore, um, sometimes in the mangroves, which you would have seen there, and reef flats, the water is extremely shallow, which really makes for a perfect place to see how they're living in such challenging conditions and what that might mean for these sharks with climate change in the future. So if these newborns have to live in challenging conditions, already challenging conditions, kind of like what we mentioned for the epaulette shark earlier, then that might make them better capable of coping with climate change conditions 
in the future. And maybe we can look at some of these traits that are important for how these newborns are coping with these challenging conditions right now that could also be important for the future. Um, so every evening we choose uh, one of the nursery areas. We catch sharks either just to take measurements or to bring them back to the laboratory. Um, we also monitor a lot of the water quality conditions as well. These are temperature loggers that are monitoring temperature conditions, which you can see here got to about 36 degrees, which is in the high 90s in Fahrenheit. And so we're doing a lot of work at these potential nursery areas, not only to understand what sharks are there, but also what those conditions are like. So we take a lot of those measurements for the sharks. We take blood samples. We can understand how they're coping with exercise stress based on their blood. A lot of these measurements we can do right in the back of the pickup truck or just from our little setup right there on the shoreline. As you can see here, we're measuring the length of the shark. We'll measure the, the weight. This has a, a bite toy in this shark because when we weigh them in a reusable grocery bag, they will bite the grocery bag and then they don't let go. So it tends to be a bit of a problem. So we've started putting a bite toy. This image I wanna pause because another thing we measure with these newborn sharks is their belly button. So this is their umbilical scar from the umbilical cord that comes from their mother when they're born. And what's really cool about this is that it's really open when we have a very newborn baby shark. And then as the shark gets a little bit older, it closes up. And so we're monitoring um, how open or how closed this belly button or umbilical scar is over the course of our field seasons as well. And this can tell us how old the shark is. Uh, another really cool thing that we um, take photos of is the black tip on their dorsal fin because it's kind of like a fingerprint. It's unique to every single shark. Uh, we monitor if sharks have bite wounds from predators or hook wounds from being accidentally caught in fishing. And so we're taking photos of all of these wounds to really kind of monitor how fast they're healing in these nurseries and what kinds of challenges. We can also monitor how much they're breathing after an exercise challenge, and that's what this tube is here. So we can monitor how much oxygen they're taking from the water and how fast they're taking up that oxygen when they're recovering from an exercise event. And then we can also bring these sharks back to the laboratory at our French research station, which you can see here, where we're doing a lot of these same measurements, but we're also doing controlled laboratory experiments. So we might have these tanks being held at current day temperatures or temperatures that are predicted for the middle of the century with climate change or ocean acidification conditions, low oxygen. And we can monitor all of these very important traits that these sharks need to have, like how much they're eating, how much they're growing, how fast they can swim, um, digestion, under controlled laboratory conditions. So without any other stressors being a problem like we would see out in the wild. So this is a really great opportunity for us as scientists to not only be able to work in the field at these potential nursery areas, but then also to be able to bring these animals back to the laboratory and do these controlled laboratory experiments where we can really identify some of those key traits that will be important for these sharks in the coming years with climate change. Now, I men mentioned that we're monitoring how fast they're breathing, how fast they recover from exercise, how fast they're breathing under different stressors, all of these athletic traits that we call that are, are really important for their survival out in the wild. And these are traits that we can monitor here. Um, how they cope with very high temperatures that they are experiencing out in the wild as our temperature monitors have told us and what that might mean for their swimming performance. Now, after all of these experiments are completed, we release all of these sharks back to the identical nursery area where we caught them originally so they can grow up and become healthy adult sharks and help protect the ecosystems around French Polynesia.
So it's really a, a very special opportunity. And we've been working on physio shark in French Polynesia for the past almost seven years now. Really, really great team. A shark nursery should be a safe place. Um, it should confer a higher fitness, as we scientists will say, for the animals that are growing up in that nursery. These nurseries are really shallow areas around the island of Moria in French Polynesia. Big predators can't really get into these shallow areas. Sometimes these shallow areas are less than knee deep. So it makes it easier for us to do the research because we don't have to go scuba diving or even snorkeling to get these sharks. But these sharks living in these shallow waters are facing extremely warm water, water that will be very low in oxygen, uh, water that can be very low in pH as well, because there's a lot of uh, biological activity that's going on in these shallows. And shallow water warms faster than deep water. So that is a big challenge for these sharks living in these nursery areas. We think that they are primarily for protection, maybe slightly for food availability, but mainly because the big predators cannot get into these areas. And this is super important that these sharks are able to tolerate these conditions in these potential nursery areas during this key phase of their early development because they need to grow as fast as possible and become healthy so that they can survive when they do move out onto the reef where there are big predators that they will have to contend with. But as I showed in the video, these newborn sharks are still facing exhaustive challenges as little athletes. They are getting chased by predators. Um, these sharks aren't the smartest when their mother gives birth. They are still learning what is a predator and what is food and how to navigate as a baby shark we'll see that they'll get bitten by trevally, bitten by eels, and sometimes accidentally caught by fishers that are fishing in the area. So these are exercise challenges or exhaustive challenges that these sharks are already facing in these shallow habitats, no matter how well protected they are. And this is something that we have to account for with climate change stressors that are already making these populations quite stressed. And climate change conditions are already making everything these sharks have to do a little bit worse. Some of the preliminary data and some of the published data that we've had from the Physio Shark Research Program in French Polynesia so far has really demonstrated that. In fact, we know that these reef sharks are already living within degrees of their thermal limits. So they're living at the edge of what they can tolerate in terms of performance and survival. So that's pretty scary because we know that the waters are continuing to warm. Now we mentioned exercise quite a bit as well and we look at recovery. Recovery is really important for these sharks because if they get chased by a predator they have to recover from that exercise so that they'll be ready to escape another predator if another predator comes or be able to chase some food to be able to have lunch. So recovery is extremely important and it turns out that it takes a really long time for these baby sharks. The shortest recovery period for the sharks that we've been investigating has been three hours, but the average is closer to eight or nine hours. Can you imagine if you did your hardest exercise and then it took you nine hours to recover? Just as humans, like we could sit on the couch and recover and watch Netflix, but for a shark, that might mean that it can't exercise again to get away from a predator if it's still recovering from the first bout of exercise. So those are some important data that we're exploring a bit more. And in fact, if a shark has to exercise at high temperatures, mortality is highly likely, 80%, which is scary. So 33 degrees Celsius or about 91 degrees Fahrenheit. These are temperatures that these sharks can see every once in a while in these shallow potential nursery areas. And if they have to exercise hard at those high temperatures, survival might not be possible. Then if we give them two stressors that are associated with climate change, like ocean warming and ocean acidification, we know that just basic costs of being alive just to survive, those energy requirements are higher 
if they have to deal with both of those stressors at the same time. And that is what's, what is coming already with climate change. It's not just ocean warming. It's not just ocean acidification. It's everything. So this, to me and my team, tells me these are all the more reasons to keep healthy nurseries and sanctuaries for sharks and for other ecosystems. Sharks are the most threatened vertebrates on the planet, organisms with a backbone like ourselves. This is from the IUCN. The, all of the organisms that have been assessed by scientists, over 30,000 species are threatened with extinction. And that's over a quarter, over 25% of all of the species that are assessed. So one out of four species that have been investigated is in trouble, which is so scary. And like I mentioned here in this, this red infogram, 30% of sharks and rays. There are only about a thousand species of sharks and rays on the planet today. And if 30%, that's, that's 300 threatened with extinction. So this, this tells us we've got some big problems to be addressing as scientists, as humans, as global citizens. We know that the top threat to shark populations worldwide is overfishing. Shark fin trade is a huge industry. Every year, about 73 million sharks are killed just for their fins. And it's an industry that's worth about 400 million U.S. dollars per year. Shark meat is more likely to be consumed locally, not necessarily shipped around the globe, but shark meat is a problem as well. That issue represents about 240 million US dollars per year. Um, so if you ever see the word flake on like a fish and chips menu or on, on a menu at a restaurant, that's usually what it is. It's usually shark meat. And then there are other shark products like oil and cartilage squalene, if you ever see that on pharmaceutical labels that aren't as easily accounted for. So overfishing is absolutely a huge issue. It turns out that about 3 billion people on the planet are relying on wild caught or farmed seafood for protein. And many of these people, such as those that are living on small island nations, they rely on fish for their only source of protein. So food-wise, it's the largest traded commodity in the world for fish, fish in general, not just sharks. Yet about 80% of all fish stocks on the planet are overexploited. Many sharks that are caught accidentally don't live, and even then they're just thrown back into the oceans. So with this heavy reliance as a, as a planet on healthy ecosystems and fish for protein, for nourishment, for many communities, if the predators that are really responsible for healthy ecosystems are being fished for their fins, being exploited for fishing, that is a really big problem. And so this is really shark's top stressor. And second would be climate change. What are we doing about this? Well, I've mentioned shark sanctuaries a few times now. Shark sanctuaries like those in French Polynesia and marine protected areas like the Great Barrier Reef are partial solutions. Shark sanctuaries are a type of marine park. Uh, this particular one in French Polynesia was first completely implemented around 2009. As I've mentioned, it prohibits all fishing, exploitation, and trade of any shark products, which is absolutely fantastic. I mean, given the previous few slides that we saw, with shark finning and fishing and bycatch, that is a huge problem. And that is eliminated from sharks in French Polynesia. This is encompassing all these shark sanctuaries, about 20 million square kilometers that are protected. And if we think of that land-wise, that would be larger than the United States and Canada in total, which sounds amazing, but it's just still only a small fraction of the oceans that are protected for sharks. The largest, like I said, being French Polynesia is about half of the United States in total size. So these are really, really great steps that we're taking that will protect sharks from their number one threat, which is overfishing, exploitation, trade, and shark finning. But as I circle back, even the best protected 
shark sanctuaries and marine parks are not immune to climate change. So climate change will cross all of those dotted lines around those countries, no matter what kinds of regulations we put on these areas. So yes, that is a first step, but we really do need to look at their second stressor, which is climate change. Today, we know that the greatest threats to the oceans and all of these amazing athletes like our two shark species that we've looked at today, the biggest threat is human induced climate change. And we know that this is coming from an increase in carbon emissions into the atmosphere, greenhouse gases, which are warming the ocean and acidifying the oceans, and all of these increases in industrial and agricultural pollution are degrading water quality. They're increasing sediment loads, destroying crucial habitat, like those potential nursery areas around the islands. They're so important for these newborn reef sharks. Today, we are changing our oceans at a rate faster than has ever been documented in human history. These are the issues that, that we've been investigating, not only these two species of sharks, but, but many other species of sharks and coral reef fishes for my career. So what do we do? Education is such a huge part of my job as a scientist. Um, we go to a lot of the schools around the island where we work and talk to the kids. Um, we learn from them. We learn from their parents. We learn about the importance of culture of sharks within the community, within the Polynesian culture, and how they have been for thousands of years protecting sharks because they know how important sharks are to their ecosystems and to their food sources and their livelihood. We do Sharks for Kids exercises with our school groups and we talk about lots of different species of sharks, which ones are threatened and interesting aspects of their life history. It's a lot of fun and I think that this is probably one of the most important things that we as scientists can be doing right now with our research is getting it out to the next generation of shark scientists, like many of you who might be watching today. Public engagement is really important as well. Kids that are watching, you know, you can't vote yet, but your parents can, your aunties and your uncles can, your grandparents can, and talking to your parents about the importance of curbing global emissions, curbing uh, greenhouse gas emissions so that we can start protecting the oceans a bit better from climate change, protecting a lot of these species that we're all in love with and that we know are super important for healthy marine ecosystems. We also did a documentary which is free to view on YouTube and Vimeo. And we're super proud of this. It's very short, it's nine minutes. Super proud of this documentary. It debuted at the Wildlife and Conservation Film Festival in New York City and a few other film festivals around the world. I think one in the Bahamas as well. It was one of our ways of getting our research in French Polynesia out to the rest of the world. So check out PhysioShark if you get a chance on Vimeo. I put some links on Twitter as well. And of course, you can find all of us at PhysioShark on lots of various forms of social media. I want to close with just a few things. I think that sometimes we feel a little bit powerless in what we can do, um, especially as kids. I thought what I could do is become a scientist, and that's what I did when I was, you know, standing in those cornfields many, many years ago and being inspired by documentaries and talks and scientists. I find as an individual, and I know a lot of the kids that I've spoken to feel a bit powerless. A lot of the kids think, well, I can't vote, so what can I do? There's a lot that we can do as individuals, and so I usually like to conclude my talk with what are three things that we can do to help shark populations worldwide and to protect these marine ecosystems that are so important? First of all, we can boycott shark products. So if we don't buy anything that has shark in it, then maybe that industry will collapse and there will be no, no need for it anymore. So if we say no to shark meat, say no to shark products or oils that are in our cosmetics or supplements, then that is sending a message that we don't want sharks harvested for those reasons anymore. Number two, if you can drive, we try to drive a little bit less. So curb fossil fuel use and also single use plastic. So, 
you know, taking a plastic fork from a cafe or using a plastic straw, well, those are all coming from fossil fuel use. And that plastic stays in the ecosystem for a very, very long time, probably forever. So if we can stop using single use plastic, which is those types of items, and also start to curb our reliance on fossil fuels, um, start to rely more on renewables like solar, then we can also help sharks that way. And thirdly, like I've been mentioning in the past few slides, it's important to spread the word. So I really try to do that with my research program, having an education and outreach component. We're all over social media, which I think is definitely today's means for getting information out there. Um, but it's important for you to do that as well. Talk to your parents, talk to your aunties and your uncles, grandparents, those that can vote. Tell them how important this is, how important it is for us to start looking at clean energy as our primary energy source so that we can stop global warming and we can stop climate change from stressing these populations and these ocean ecosystems. So this has been my team over the past several years. So I couldn't do this work alone. So I have a huge shout out to a lot of these individuals here in these photos that have contributed to much of this research. And of course, my research program. Definitely check us out on the internet and social media. Feel free to send us questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jillian, and, and thank you, Jody, uh, for so much for sharing your um, your research, a little bit about these sharks. I think it's really exciting because um, when people talk about sharks, oftentimes it's white sharks and tiger sharks and, and the obvious big um, kind of charismatic species, but I think it's really important for kids and just the general public to learn a little bit more about the little guys and just how important they are as well. So. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. So what I'm going to do now is we'll go through some of the questions. Um, one of the first ones is, okay, you talked a little bit about um, how the, just a slight change in temperature can affect these animals with their recovery time. Do you think that's in part because of their size? Are we seeing that with larger species of sharks as well? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, you know, one of the reasons that we're working with the newborn black tip reef sharks is because we can keep them in the laboratory and we can uh, do these experiments on them. Um, and because we know that they're already facing some of these challenging conditions where they live. And so um, logistically, it's a bit easier to work with the newborns for that reason. But also, if we think about the adults, they're off on the reefs in a, a little bit deeper water where um, temperatures, for example, aren't going to be fluctuating nearly as much. And so that is a really, really great question, question that we'd like to explore. We just can't do it as well in the laboratory as we can with the newborn sharks because of their size. And so we've got some ideas to, to be monitoring the adults to see what kinds of temperatures they're experiencing and finding some ways with, you know, some of the technology we use on human athletes like our, you know, Apple Watch to find out if they're changing performance under elevated temperatures as well. Um, but it's just a little bit harder with a shark that's about four feet long, so. Great, um, another question is, uh, the warmer epaulet babies seemed a little rounder. Is that common or a noteworthy trend? I don't know if they're trying to say like they were slightly bigger or, um, uh, but yeah, asking about, I think the size. Are you calling my sharks fat? <laughs> Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. So um, what we do know so far, and it's not published yet, so you guys are all, all getting a little sneak peek, is that when we do raise the eggs under warmer conditions, they hatch faster. And so we don't know, like maybe these babies, while they're developing in the eggs, are trying to use that yolk as fast as possible because all of the metabolic rates, all of the biochemical rates inside their body are also happening faster under warmer conditions. And so because we know they're gonna hatch faster with elevated temperatures, maybe that's also the case as well. Maybe they're just uh, using that energy faster so that they're gonna be prepared when they do hatch and they have to, you know, in the wild, swim around and, and look for food and 
uh, get away from predators and that kind of thing. So it might just be a preparation thing. We're not quite sure yet. Very interesting. Uh, the next question is, so they were asking about the size range. So with the baby sharks, um, are there ones that are like quite considerably larger than others? There's obviously an average size um, that the babies are, but do you ever see um, one that's just significantly larger than the others? Have you encountered that? Well, at our field sites in French Polynesia, very rarely, but sometimes we will catch one-year-olds in our nets. Um, they won't have a belly button anymore. You won't see that scar. Um, so that's one of the, the ways we know. And because we've been monitoring these sharks for so many years now, they all have um, uh, an internal tag, like a barcode tag, like a lot of people use with their pets. So we can use a barcode reader like they have at the grocery store, and we can see if we've caught that shark before. So sometimes we know we catch a one-year-old, but usually that's the only time we'll get a uh, a young shark that's a little bit bigger than the newborns. Now what's really cool is that sometimes we will get a newborn shark that we think might have been born like that day. And the reason we know this is because their their belly button is really open and also they're, they're kind of slimy, which sharks, as you guys probably know, they're not slimy, they feel like sandpaper. Because their dermal denticles or their scales are not quite formed right away when they're born, they do feel a lot softer um, in those first couple days of their life. So sometimes we'll get one like that and they're on the smaller side, very cute, but usually it's around that 50 centimeters, one and a half feet area for the newborns. Yeah, it's, it's really remarkable having seen a lemon shark actually give birth. Uh, different species of lemon, but um, a lemon shark in the Bahamas give birth. And yeah, just seeing those newborns, that belly button that's open and just, yeah, they're definitely a bit, you know, almost squishier, if you will, I guess, for the, the term. And uh, yeah, it's incredible. And then if, you know, you see them again several weeks later, recapture them, um, just to see how much they've changed and really adapted to survival um, and are these perfect miniature copies. It's, it's really incredible. Um, Absolutely. Well, I mean, we know that the same species of black tip reef shark that's found um, in other island groups, not in French Polynesia, they can be smaller just as a population. It's the same species. So a lot of that has to do with uh, the size of the parents as well. So there's a lot of factors there, but yeah, it's, it's so interesting. Yeah, it definitely is. All right. Um, next question is, what do the blood samples genuinely reveal about performance? I guess maybe what are you in that specific sample? What maybe key markers are you looking for or kind of how you're assessing that? That's an awesome question. Blood is my favorite. Um, I've been called the fish vampire and the shark vampire before. We can learn so much from the blood. Okay, so when we as humans or sharks breathe oxygen from the air that we breathe or the water that sharks breathe, that oxygen comes in contact with the blood. And there's a very important molecule in that blood, a protein called hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is found in almost every organism on the planet. It's been the most well-studied protein ever. And it's because it's so important. It grabs onto that oxygen and as the blood is flowing through the body, it delivers that oxygen to whatever tissues need it, like the muscles, the heart, the liver, whatever tissues need it. And then when that blood gets back to our lungs or the shark's gills, it will pick up some more oxygen and it'll do that same thing all over again. Um, that's something I've been studying as a physiologist for my entire career. And Things that we can learn about that molecule is how concentrated that molecule is. So if there's a lot of hemoglobin in the blood, um, maybe that's a more athletic species, humans or sharks. <laughs> um, if there are lots of red blood cells, or if they're really, really big or really small, we can learn a lot about um, how well that blood is transporting oxygen by looking at a blood sample because of that important protein. Now there's other things that we can learn from the blood as well. We can measure uh, 
um, metabolites that would come into the blood after exercise, like lactate and glucose. We can measure the pH of the blood, which will decrease if the sharks are stressed or if the sharks have been exercising. So they'll experience a decrease in blood pH. Their blood pH will get a little bit acidic. Um, we can measure stress hormones as well. We can, uh, like, there are so many possibilities with the blood. Those are just a few of the things that we've been measuring over the past several years. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. And I know some of the work I've seen is also diet. I mean, that's a really cool thing is to be able to determine. It's, it's pretty remarkable how uh, much information can be collected from a sample and how valuable the full workup and these measurements that might seem very basic, just like when we go to the doctor and get a checkup, but how much information we can actually learn from these animals just with those basic sampling techniques. So... Um, For sure. And a lot of the equipment that we use would be portable equipment that they use at the doctor's offices and hospitals for humans. We just calibrate them so that they work with sharks. So it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, let me just find another. Can the waters in Australia get rather cold and then uh, affect sharks' performance kind of in the opposite direction, as in instead of the increased temperature, looking at a decreased temperature? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question as well. So if you think of um, any aspect of performance, maybe it's swimming, maybe it's um, digestion, and over a temperature scale, that performance would be the best at some range of temperatures and if the temperatures are a little bit cooler, it'll be a little bit slow. And if the temperatures are too warm, it will slow down as well. So there's like almost a perfect bell-shaped curve for any aspect of performance, really. Now that curve might look a little bit different if you're comparing swimming versus digestion. But it tends to be that animals will have an optimal range of temperatures in which they can perform. What do these baby sharks eat? So the black chips, um, you know, and, and the epaulets when you're talking about, but, you know, what, what are you finding? Are you looking at diet and, and what do they eat? Well, um, if you think of really shallow mangrove areas around uh, an island, uh, shallow lagoons, sandy habitats, um, there's going to be very small fish. Um, small crustaceans, little crabs, little shrimps. So they're eating little things that wouldn't ever eat them. <laughs> um, what's, and that's kind of the same for the epaulette sharks as well, just because of where they live. And for the epaulette shark, their mouth is kind of on the bottom. And so, as I was mentioning earlier, they're in the group called carpet sharks. And so they're kind of crawling along the carpet, so to speak. So anything that's in the sand, they can kind of wrestle up and, and eat. Um, with the black tip reef sharks, of course, that will change as they get older. But as babies, um, you know, they don't learn how to hunt. Uh, the mother basically gives birth and leaves them in the shallows. And so they have to learn on their own how to chase a small fish or capture a little crab to eat it. Um, so that's something that we're, we're starting to study as well is uh, how long does it take them to learn how to be a shark? in terms of finding food and what they're eating. Um, but we know from some of their stomach contents, it tends to be little shrimps and crabs and tiny fish. Yeah, and one of the things you just answered, we had another question, if a baby shark gets left behind from the mother, um, will it die? And um, yeah, I mean, they're on their own, all baby sharks. It's not just this species. They're, despite the song and the family staying together, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, all species, it's, it's you know, they're kind of trial by fire right away. They're, they're on their own. And um, yeah, it's, it's amazing to see that life start. And I mean, you're seeing it when you're catching these that you know have been caught that they were born that day and they're, they're behaving like a shark. They have to, they have to find food, they have to find shelter. And um, you know, there is no parental care. So another great question. Um, does it- Yeah, they are pretty dumb at first. You gotta, I think that they do take a little while. Um, but yeah, that, that's a super interesting topic for sure. Yeah, to, to figure it out and really sort of how to learn how to be a shark, right? And kind of learning from each other. And I know that 
the studies on the learning behavior and, and social behavior is really interesting as well. They, they do learn from each other um, and by watching and interacting. So yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, so, so Maria wants to know, does it harm the, animal, the shark when you're taking them out of the water? So maybe talk a little bit about maybe some of the techniques you're using to, to minimize the stress and, and why you know, you're doing the procedure the way you are. Oh, that's a good question. Um, so as many of you might know that sharks have this really cool um, phenomenon called tonic immobility. So when you turn a shark upside down, so its belly is facing up, it kind of goes into this sort of sleepy state and you can hold it in the water um, upside down and take a blood sample or take measurements and it doesn't really move around very much. And so we're really lucky is we don't have to use any sort of anesthetic like they might use at the hospital or at the vet clinics with other animals because sharks have this phenomenon that makes them very sleepy when you turn them upside down. Now, as soon as you put them back into their normal position, oh, they'll swim away. Um, so that phenomenon we don't really understand quite yet, but it's great for scientists because it allows us to you know, take that blood sample very quickly um, in a, a very undisturbed and unstressed shark. Now, because we study stress, of course, we're looking at handling stress and air exposure and how all of these different stressors will affect the stress response, because it's really important. Um, if around the island, someone accidentally catches a fish while they're fishing for their dinner, uh, or, sorry, accidentally catches a shark while they're fishing for dinner, uh, what do they do with that shark? Well, we can say, you know, if you can get it back in the water as soon as possible, that's really important because we know air exposure does cause them some stress. Um, so we're starting to be able to give recommendations as to these various handling uh, procedures as well and how that might affect the stress response. Um, we try to keep our sharks in the water for as long as possible. Um, we can get them out of the nets, worked up and released back into the ocean in about a minute and a half. So we, we could be really, really quick with it. It's a total assembly line and you know we've, we've got it down to a science, so to speak. So how long do, this is from Trey, age eight, um, how long, or I guess, why do the sharks still have belly buttons when they're up to one year old? Or maybe how long, maybe talk about how long they last with the, with the you know, the different species or, you know, does that help you determine the age as well, the, that kind of whether it's open or closed? No, that, that's an awesome question. Um, so we've actually done a study on that. So um, who is it, Trey? Oh, you should have come join us a few years ago. You could have been one of our assistants because we were asking exactly that question. And we wanted to know if there was a, a way that we could determine how old these newborns were. Um, you know, we can't ask them. <laughs> so the, the belly button, when it's really open and really circular, um, that's usually within the first week or so. And then as it starts closing up, it'll turn into just like a very faint line and you can almost barely see it after about five weeks or so. And usually after a couple of months, only if you really, really know what you're looking for and you look really closely, you can't see it. So a two month old shark probably won't have a noticeable belly button anymore. One year old, no. What is your favorite type of shark or do you have one? Oh. See, that's the, that's the challenging question because that's what sparked this whole presentation in the first place. It's like, how do I choose? Well, okay. So I love the epaulette shark because it's so squirmy and hides and it can walk and, and it's really tolerant to a lot of these challenging conditions. And it's just, it's just a really awesome shark species to study for a scientist especially for a physiologist, um, you know, if we're thinking of like an exercise challenge, do we make them walk or do we make them swim? So that's a good question. Um, I love the black tip reef shark newborns because, you know, they are like physically a beautiful shark. Um, some of you might know that black tip reef sharks and other reef sharks, other sharks 
um, as adults, they tend to have lots of scratches on them and lots of uh, bite wounds and that kind of thing from other sharks. And they do that when they're mating as well. And so the newborns are just the pristine. And I think because they're living in these shallow environments as well, they offer a unique opportunity for us to investigate their physiology as little athletes as well. So I choose two species. I can't choose one. Yeah, it's definitely a, a tough one um, with so many. And as new species are being discovered as well, I think it's it's always really exciting um, to add to the to the list as well. Um, do from Rowan, do great whites suffer, or do we know if they suffer from that same kind of tiredness or a kind of exhaustion from the increased temperatures? Now, obviously, they're a shark that is in a different climate, cooler waters. Um, has that been looked at? Is there information on that? Well, you know, we can get a lot of information from the blood samples from great white sharks as well. Um, so when they're caught, if we know what temperatures they've been in, um, we can start to associate those temperatures with different markers in their blood samples that might tell us if they are more stressed or less stressed. Um, we can't put them in those chambers that we use for our little sharks to see how long it takes them to recover. Um, so I think one of the really important things that we're doing with this research is maybe just trying to find out some of this information that could be applied to other shark species that we can't work with in the laboratory. So if we say that under these temperature conditions, it takes a black tip reef shark um, as little as three hours, but on average more like eight or nine hours to recover from exercise. Could that be the case for an adult black tip reef shark? Could that be the case for a different species of shark? And that's where we really like to take some of these ideas. Great. And we have one from Miles, age six. Um, how long does it take or when do the, the sharks hatch? So I'm guessing like how long um, does it take those sharks to, like, how long are they in the egg case for? Well, that depends on temperature. So um, if the eggs are being raised under what we would call our sort of summer average temperatures around the 27, 28 degrees Celsius mark or so, um, which is, you know, still pretty warm, I guess, depending on where you live on the planet right now, <laughs> then a, a couple months three months maybe, um, anywhere from three to five months. Uh, if we increase the temperatures, they will hatch a lot sooner. Um, so that's, that's a project that we just finished with one of my PhD students and hopefully will be published soon. So cutting edge data right here that temperature increases or uh, speeds up hatching. Great, and we're gonna do two more. So. Uh, Marley's asking, how do you know they are recovered from being tired? What are your, what's your marker? What's your um, definition of, yeah, this one's okay and seems back to normal? Well, how do we know when we recovered from exercise, right? So um, like I was mentioning, a lot of the inspiration for some of the experiments that we do comes from human athletes and the technology that we use from, for human athletes. Um, we've got much better technology for human athletes than we do for sharks right now, but we're working on that. And with those chambers that we put the sharks into after they've exercised, what we're monitoring is how fast they're breathing. So how fast they're taking oxygen from that water to use to the, in their body. Um, and if they're taking oxygen from that water really, really, really fast, then they're probably still recovering from that exercise. And if we can get them to sort of like a resting level where that oxygen uptake rate or that breathing rate isn't changing anymore, then we know that they've recovered. And we validated a lot of those experiments in the laboratory with calm resting sharks that have no stress whatsoever at um, summer average temperatures, and so we've been able to validate that sort of resting curve so we know when they've recovered. But we use oxygen uptake rates or breathing rates as a proxy for recovery. Whereas we might use like our heart rate when our 
heart rate is really, really high, maybe it's 170 beats per minute, we're exercising as hard as we possibly can, and then when it comes back down to resting levels, maybe 50 beats per minute, we know that we've recovered. So very similar. Great. And our last one is from Brinia, age five. Uh, how do you catch them? So what equipment are you using? I know you talked a little bit, kind of showed, but yeah, can you just explain a little bit about how you're actually catching the sharks? Well, the epaulette sharks, um, we catch with just uh, dip nets. So big landing nets that you would use um, for other fish species, uh, usually two of them. And we look for a really low tide, it tends to be full moon. And during the low tide, we can just wade out into the water and even on snorkel, we don't have to even go diving or anything like that. Um, and basically just scoop them up. Uh, you just have to make sure that they don't crawl into a reef and hide. Um, so that's for the epaulette sharks. For the black tip reef sharks, we use a gill net. And so um, you might've seen in some of the video footage, I know it went kind of fast. We stretch a gill net that's about 50 meters long um, perpendicular to the shoreline. And so if the shark is swimming along the shoreline, it'll reach this net and it'll get stuck. Now, we have gotten so used to knowing when a shark hits the net that we can get that shark out of the net, measured all of our samples within a couple of minutes. So we get that shark out of the net and we call that exercise. So that is that, that shark's form of exercise. So if we're taking samples to understand how it's coping with exercise, that would happen right then. And that's how we catch the baby black tips. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Jody. All amazing information. Again, uh, just really interesting to learn about some less, uh, lesser known species or maybe the ones that um, don't get as much attention but are still really incredible. And I think with the current situation in the world, this kind of research is, is really critical for not just sharks, it sort of stems out to, to understand um, how animals around the world are being impacted um, by the changing Earth's conditions. So uh, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined us. Uh, we did as many questions as we could. If you guys still have additional questions, feel free to send them uh, to our email. Uh, we'll do our best to get those answered. And make sure you stay tuned to the schedule because we have some more JOSM webinars coming up soon. But thank you again, Jody, for all the wonderful information and sharing your time with us. And thanks so much to everyone that joined. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Guys.